Mika, stand up for a minute. Okay, now you can sit down. In addition to the talent he has, did you notice there was no music? I can't talk for 15 minutes without five pages of notes, and he does that with nothing. How do you keep that in your head? He's young. Yeah, he's young. <laughs> I was going to contrast the first piece of music with the piano and the clarinet, and both of them had music. Never mind. They said it. I. <laughs> Thank you, Mika. We're continuing our series on the life of Moses. When we were together last, we watched the golden calf situation in Exodus chapter 32. So you might want to open there. We'll be close, I'm pretty sure. Today we're going to cover probably, at least in my mind, the most vital section in the Bible that we need to understand if we're going to have an intimate relationship with God. There's lots of important passages, but if you want to have an intimate, loving relationship with God, you need to understand what Moses is going to teach us today in Exodus chapter 33 and 34. This is probably the most important because God reveals his glory in written form for those of us who aren't in the rock with Moses. And for us to understand and get this glimpse of God's glory, there's three things we have to do. First, we have to seek the pardon of God. We also have to covet the presence of God. And we have to desire more than anything else the very person of God. So let's see how Moses illustrates these three behaviors as we turn to Exodus chapter 33. This is after the fiasco of the Israelites and the golden calf. After Moses figures out what was going on, he prays for God's mercy. And God answers the Moses prayer, but there's a stipulation. Looks at Exodus 33, verses 1 through 3. Then the Lord said to Moses, Depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your descendants I will give it, and I will send my angel before you. And I will drive out a whole bunch of people that I can't pronounce. Verse 3, go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. Now, I wrote this sermon last week while I was being a veggie cop at camp meeting. There's a picture of us veggie cops across from the men's bathroom if you need to see what a veggie cop looks like. And I was having trouble with the concept of stiff-necked people. So if you know anything about Southern, you know they have a pretty impressive research library. So I go in there and read about 22 different commentaries on the term stiff-necked people. And I didn't get a real clear understanding of how to communicate that to you. And then by the end of the week, God answered my prayer on how to communicate that concept to you. It started the first day I was at camp meeting. The veggie cops and the transportation people drive golf carts. So in the morning devotion and announcement time, we got the reminder that golf carts are to be only on the sidewalk. If you've been to Southern, you know it's a very nice campus. They maintain it quite well, and so we don't want the grass messed up by golf carts. Seems pretty straightforward. Don't drive on the grass. I mean, even a slow person like me can figure that out. So Tuesday is preparation day. We get everything ready. You know, the divisions get ready for the children, and we have a meal that night at the uh, dining hall, and 
Thursday morning we have worship again because we need to get ready because you all are coming. So in the announcement period of our worship time, we were reminded not to drive on the grass. Seemed pretty clear to me the first day. But apparently some of us were a little bit slow in learning. So you all come on Wednesday night. We have our first meeting. Thursday morning at worship, not only are we reminded in worship announcements, but all the veggie cops and all the transportation people have an hour meeting afterwards. You don't understand how many different ways we were told, don't drive on the grass. To the point where the campus security, they're kind of like one step above veggie cops, and College Dale police, they're the ones who have the guns, so they're important. They are there and they are threatening us that if we drive on the grass, we are going to be arrested and prosecuted. Now, you would think after three times and being threatened with your job, you would get the idea. Oh, no. I'm at the security crossing place. I'm, you know, I go like this a lot. That's my job at camp meeting. Wait, come, wait, so you guys don't get run over by cars. And behind me is the upper level parking area of the main church. That's the overflow parking where people go and we bring them down in shuttles to the main meeting. I kid you not. This is Friday. We've had four meetings on the topic of don't drive on the grass. And here is one of our pastors driving an eight passenger golf cart literally up the hill. I now understand what God meant when he said, stiff-necked people. Some of us are just slow to learn. And the Israelites in Exodus 32 demonstrated that they, like one of my fellow pastors, sometimes either just don't get it or they choose to ignore it. Now, if that helps you understand stiff-necked people Good. If not, go on a mental veg vacation because I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about stiff-necked people because that's what God called his family in the desert. And I'm afraid some of us in his family aren't much different. This is not a compliment if you're not with me yet. This is kind of a warning. And because of their stiff-neckedness, naked. Because they're stubborn. God says he's not going to go with them to the promised land. Why? Why would God say, I'm not going with you anymore? Disobedience, disobedience is, we have a simpler word for disobedience. It has three letters, starts with an S. What's it called? Sin. Sin. God knows that his stiff-necked people are more than likely going to sin again, and if he was with them, what's going to happen to the sinners? They're going to get wiped out instantly. God and sin don't mix, and he wins every one of those competitions. So he knows that he loves his children. His children are going to be stiff-necked for a little while longer. They're kind of slow learners, so he excuses himself so they have a chance of surviving. Now, keep your finger in Exodus 33. We're going to come back. But I want you to turn to Acts 7 for a moment. Other people use this concept of being stiff-necked to describe those who have fallen out of their relationship with God. I want you to be in Acts chapter 7. Look at what Stephen says in verse 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. 
you, talking about the Pharisees and the leaders, always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Here's this upstart deacon describing the leadership of the then church and using perhaps the greatest insult he can think of. Calling the leaders of his church stiff-necked and uncircumcised is probably the greatest put-down he could think of. Sometimes we're just like that. Sometimes we resist the Holy Spirit. I remember Dale saying something about that. I'm sure Bernita has bruises on her shoulder. Those of you who missed it at Sabbath school, you need to come. You miss good things. We, too, resist the Holy Spirit because we are stiff-necked and uncircumcised. And if we fall into that category, God's telling us to go to the promised land. But I'm not going with you because you might sin and that ain't going to be good. Find... Psalms 78. This ties in with Sean's presentation last week. Where's, where's my wife? I think she's downstairs, so I'm safe. Oh, no, you're there. Okay. <laughs> Between watching Dwight Nelson and Sean, she picked Sean. Seventy-eight, Psalm, verse 5. We're still thinking about this stiff neck idea. For God established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, for they should make them known to their children. Fathers, children, get the connection now? That the generation to come might know them. The children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children. It's kind of how socialization works. That they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and not be stiff-necked. And may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright, and, those, and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Being described as stiff-necked is at the opposite end of the spectrum from having an intimate relationship with God. And do you know who controls whether you're stiff-necked or not? The person in the mirror. And so if our goal is to have an intimate relationship with God, if we want to have a glimpse of God's glory then we have to choose not to be stiff-necked. Nobody makes you that way. Although we sometimes like to blame a lot of things. That's a choice I make. Whether I am obedient to God's commands or I choose to be a stiff-necked, rebellious, disobedient God knows that if he is in the presence of sin, it's not going to go well. So he sends an angel instead of the cloud in the pillar of fire. I'm pretty sure an angel could get the people to the promised land, don't you think? So it isn't like they're going to be lost. It's just that God's presence isn't going to be with them as they travel. Notice what happens when Moses shares the news. Exodus 33, verse 4. And when the people heard these grave tidings that God wasn't going with them, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. That's an interesting phrase. Verse 6. So the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments 
what in the world is an ornament? It sounds like they're a herd of Christmas trees. But it is ornaments, rings, necklaces, bracelets, anklets, and they're all associated with the golden calf. Remember, the Jews had just come out of Egypt, and they had seen for 400 years the Egyptians worship their god Apus, the bull god, with flashy jewelry. So, remember back the last time we were together, the Jews had trouble with this invisible God, so they asked Aaron to make them something they could see. He made the golden calf, and as long as we're going that way, we might as well put on some Christmas ornaments and worship the golden calf. Because the wearing of the jewelry and the golden calf worship were of Egyptian influence, what's going on here is the Jewish people are choosing to repent. They understand they have taken a wrong turn and they are turning their back on the wrong way and are choosing to follow the right way. We heard about repentance earlier today. In fact, it was one of the focuses of the Sabbath school program at 930 that Terry did for us. The thought I want to plan in your mind, if we want to have an intimate relationship with God, like Moses does, then we have to have repentance of known sin in our life. Repentance means you turn your back and go the other way. Why is it so quiet all of a sudden? Mm, I think your mind is thinking about all those secret sins. Here's the idea about repentance. It's one thing to know that God... And science tell us it's not good to consume caffeine. That's up here. Repentance is when I choose to implement that truth in my life. We are really good at pointing out sin, especially in others. But repentance is when I understand the sins I'm engaged in. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, choose to stop doing them. Then I will have sought the pardon of God, which is the first of the three things we have to do if we're going to glimpse His glory. After we ask for His pardon and demonstrate our repentance, you also have to covet the presence of God. Moses is broken hearted because God's not going to be leading out in their journey. So as he often did, he takes action. Go to Exodus 33, verse 7. So Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of meeting. And it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. Now, please remember, this is not the wilderness tabernacle that we've talked about. This is Moses' personal tent that he pitches outside of the camp. Which begs the question, why? Why wouldn't he pitch his tent with the camp? It's outside the camp, but it's because he knows God's presence isn't in the camp. So if he wants to commune with God, he has to leave the camp so God's presence will come down and commune with him. Notice what happens when Moses goes into the tent, verse 9. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle, this tent we're talking about, 
that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. Verse 10. All the people in the camp saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose and worshipped each man in his own tent. So the camp of the Israelites sees the presence of God over Moses' tent. They're back in the camp in their tent. You with me? So Moses pitches a tent and seeks the very presence of God. The mass majority of the Jews aren't qualified to have that kind of an intimate relationship because they're stiff-necked. Verse 11. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. That's a pretty good description of the intimate relationship that Moses has with God. Amen. Moses and the Jews could have made it to the promised land with the angel acting as a guide. I've already said that. But that wasn't Moses' desire. Moses wanted the very presence of God to be with him. Look at verse 13. Moses says, Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. Moses isn't satisfied with an angel guide. He wants the very presence of God. And once again, God responds to Moses' prayer. Look at verse 14. And God said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Remember that verse next week, because we're going to talk about how fatigued Moses is dealing with his stiff-necked people. Moses approaches God and says, I seek your very presence. God responds with his mercy and says, I will go with you. Now, Moses makes this request because he already has the degree of intimacy with God and he has come to the understanding that nothing can fill his soul except the very presence of God. If God wasn't going to go with Moses to the promised land, Moses didn't want to go either. He would rather stay in a desert, in the tent where God's presence was, than go to the promised land. I'm not sure I'm ready to make that kind of a statement. I've been in a desert. They're not very fun. Moses was in the desert for 40 years. He knows what he's talking about. And yet he says, God, I'd rather be with you than have the best place on earth. Verse 15. Then Moses said to God, If your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. God sees that Moses covets the very presence of God above everything or anything else. God is moved when he hears this from Moses. And again he says, I will go with you. God doesn't abandon his people. But sometimes he withdraws his presence when we engage in sin. Because he can't stand sin. As much as he loves us, he detests sin. So if we choose to engage in sin, the de as upset he is about sin, 
supersedes his love for us. When we choose to be stiff-necked. Find James chapter 4. God abandons rebellious, stiff-necked children. Sin interferes with an intimate relationship with God. James chapter 4, verse 7. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded, stiff-necked. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. You and I can choose to either be stiff-necked or we can choose to covet the brave presence of God. And it's obvious which one we have chosen because our behavior will tell us. Do I engage in things that I know are displeasing to God or would I rather be in the worst possible situation as long as I know God is there. It's true God is never very far from us, according to Acts 17, 27, but he doesn't impose himself into our lives. He wants us to seek after him. Find 2 Chronicles chapter 15. Second Chronicles chapter 15. I don't hear many pages turning. I know you couldn't have found it that fast. Because I hadn't found it yet and I haven't marked. Second Chronicles 15. It's kind of near the front. God is not going to impose himself in our lives. 2 Chronicles 15, the second half of verse 2, says, The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. You define the type of relationship you have with God. You want an intimate relationship? Be intimate with God. So how do you go about drawing near to God and have this intimate relationship that Moses has? Well, that's a whole sermon in itself, but I'll give you two ideas. The first is in the book of Hebrews. Find Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7, look at verse 25. This is a passage you know, or a verse you know. Hebrews 7, 25. Therefore he, Jesus, is, able, is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he ever lives to make intercession for him. The way you have an intimate relationship with God is to draw near to him through faith in Jesus Christ. Without faith in Jesus Christ, the doorway to an intimate relationship with God, you can't get there from here. You can know about God. You can know about what the Bible says, but you aren't going to have an intimate knowledge of God unless you demonstrate faith in Jesus Christ. That's step one. Hosea chapter 14 is step two. That'll take you a second to find that too. So I'll wait. Amen. Hosea 14, verse 7. 
Chapter 14. So you need to invest in these little blue flags. And you put them right where you need it. And then you have so many you forget where you're going. Hosea chapter 14. Look with me at verses 1 and 2. O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your sin. Take words with you and return to the Lord to say to him, take away all sin. Receive us graciously, for we will offer sacrifices of our lips. That's a description of repenting from all known sin in our lives. To have an intimate relationship with God, you have to have the same desire for His presence that Moses is showing in verse, or in Exodus chapter 33. To have an intimate relationship with God, you have to realize that nothing in this world or nothing the prince of this world can offer can fill the emptiness in your soul like an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. You have to covet the very presence of God. To get a glimpse of His glory, you have to ask for His pardon, which involves being repentant of your known sin. You have to seek, covet, work towards having God's presence with you, which requires faith in what Jesus did to wash you of your sin, and then again repent from the sin that is still there. There's one more illustration that Moses gives us about how to get a glimpse of God's glory. It's back in Exodus chapter 33. We're in verse 18. Exodus 33 verse 18. And Moses said, please show me your glory. Now when I was working on the sermon... I thought back of all the prayers I've engaged in, and I can't once remember making that request. Maybe you have. I, I can't remember ever asking God to do that. I ask Him a lot of things, but that hasn't been one of them. And yet God wants to show us His glory if we just ask. He never imposes. And Moses shows that his greatest desire, Moses' greatest desire, <coughs> is to have an intimate relationship with God, and he wants to see all of God. Moses, at this point, has already spent 40 days on Mount Sinai getting the Ten Commandments from God. Moses has been privileged more than any other man since the fall in his relationship with God, but he asks for more. Moses reminds us we only can have one first priority in our lives. You can't have two. What's our first priority? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all this other stuff will take care of itself. Amen. And yet Satan wants us chasing after all that other stuff, doesn't he? God gives Moses a pretty awesome answer to his request. Go to verse 19. Then God said, I will make my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. There's a sermon in that verse alone. Goodness refers to the whole character and nature of God. Moses is going to get it all. Lord, in verse 19, means the one who is, who was, and who will be. He's getting it all on all of it. God's mercy and compassion can't be earned. It's only given to those who God wants to give it to. Verse 20, God warns Moses 
you can't see my face, for no one can see me and live. But God is impressed with Moses' request. So God tells Moses to stand on a rock. And as his glory passes, God is going to hide Moses in the cleft of a rock. We're going to sing about that maybe in a few minutes if I ever get through this. God would cover his hand. The words hand and back are an anthropomorphism. See how it's highlighted in gold? It's like, you've got to get this one right. Anthropomorphism is attributing human characteristics to God. Hand, back. God is using tools to help us mere mortals understand who he is. Gene Brewer, who I like to pick on because he always sits up front and Dale's bigger than I am and he beats me up when I pick on him. Think about Gene Brewer trying to describe the complexity of the human mind, which he does quite well to us, but this time he's explaining it to white lab rats. That's what God's trying to do to Moses. God is trying to communicate all of his nature and character to a mere mortal who can't understand in the first place. So we're in Exodus 34, chapter 1. And the Lord said to Moses, cut two tablets of stone like the first ones, and I will write on these tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. <laughs> Early in the morning, Moses takes the tablets that he has cut and climbs to the top of Mount Sinai, which according to the experts is 7,500 feet tall and takes about four and a half hours to climb. Just in case you were thinking about it. There are... 3,700 steps up the mountain, for those of you who want to go over there and do it. Then God comes down and communes with Moses. Verse 5. Then the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of God. And now God answers the prayer of Moses, the request to see his glory. And God reveals seven aspects of his glory in written form, because we weren't there. Verse 6. And the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the Father upon the children and the children's children to the third, gen third and fourth generation. Now, in case you didn't get these seven characteristics, I'll quickly review them for you. God is compassionate. He is tender and sympathetic with an urge to help us mere mortals. God is gracious. He gives unmerited favor to those of us who don't deserve it. God is slow to anger. This is a natural consequence of the first two characteristics, his compassion and his graciousness. God is abounding in love. His limitless well of love never runs dry. We heard about water earlier today, about some people not having enough. God always has enough. God is faithful. He always does what he promises, good and bad. God is forgiving under the circumstances. He forgives wickedness, rebellion, and sin if we follow his instructions. And God is balanced. His love and grace are balanced by his law and his judgment. That's the character of God that Moses saw as he walked by. And although we're not in the cleft of the rock with Moses, we too can understand the complete character of the God of heaven. Notice what Moses does in response, verse 8. So Moses made haste and bowed his head towards the earth and worshipped. How do we respond when we're in the presence of God? 
lift your toes up, you're going to get hurt. If I'm reading the bulletin right, we bring coffee into the sanctuary, spill it on the carpet, or we spill baby formula on the carpet and just kind of leave it there, or we talk with one another during worship, or we're on our cell phones during worship. Have I covered, is anybody I missed? Do we worship God while we are in his presence, or do we just wait for the pastor to shut up so we can sing and go home? We choose to be stiff-necked or we choose to have an intimate relationship with God. The choice is ours. Moses chose to worship God. Once again, Moses is up on the mountain with God for 40 days. And as God spoke, Moses wrote down the Ten Commandments. The first set of tablets were broken. Those tablets were inscribed by the very finger of God. These tablets are carved by Moses with a hammer and chisel. Here's an interesting thought. Sin always causes us to end up with God's second best. The sin of the golden calf meant God's inscribed tablets no longer exist. But when we repent, ask forgiveness, we get tablets made by a man. Here's another illustration. How many people think Adam and Eve would have rather lived inside the garden than outside the garden? I would. Why would I want to toil for food? Just go pick it off the vine. Go to Genesis chapter 3 for a minute. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 and onward. Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you should not eat, cursed is the ground for your sake, In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles you shall bring forth for you. Aren't you lucky? And you shall eat the herb of the field. And in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. In other words, till you die. Sinners settle for second best now. Just like Adam and Eve settled for second best. But there is hope. Jump forward to verse 24. So God drove out the man and he placed an angel at the east of the garden and a flaming sword which he turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. I want you to notice that even though we're settling for second best, the perfection still exists. And in the right moment in God's time, he'll let his children back into perfection. So we can go through life being stiff-necked, rebellious, or we can follow Moses' example and have an intimate relationship with God, knowing that that intimate relationship will prepare us to go with Jesus to heaven when he comes to take us home. An intimate relationship with God is capable for any and all of us as long as we choose to have it. It's important to claim the cleansing power of Jesus' shed blood. That's the pardon we need from God. Because we too are stiff-necked people. But if that's where you stop in your relationship with God, you can't get there from here. Sanctification, glorification, those are byproducts of an intimate relationship with God. If you continue to choose... 
to be a rebellious, stiff-necked person, the sanctification doesn't happen. Without the sanctification, you aren't going to be ready to see Jesus come in the clouds. Because when he comes in the clouds and you're not ready, it'll be like missing the bus. And there is no second chance. So my challenge to you today is to think about what Moses said. If your presence doesn't go with me, I don't want to go. And you and I, through our behaviors, tell God whether we want to be stiff-necked or whether we want an intimate relationship. The power is in our hands. I think we're going to sing 520, if I understood the bulletin that I've misplaced. Let's all stand as we sing number 520. He hideth my soul. Amen. Sing all four stanzas.
Father, we thank you that you are willing to have an intimate relationship with each of us. Thank you for the illustration that Moses provided that we know what it will take for us to be that special friend of yours. Thank you for Jesus who died on the cross that the first pardon would be given. But help us to understand, Lord, that there is more after accepting his shed blood. Provide your Holy Spirit that we might choose to be an obedient, loving child that we might have that intimate relationship and be ready to see Jesus when he comes in the clouds. Is our prayer in his name. Amen. Amen.